Hi again, I'm Mark. We're going to have a Bible class on Daniel chapter 11 up to verse 31. Why is this chapter important? When Jesus of Nazareth was asked about his future return to this earth, he didn't point his disciples toward the prophet Ezekiel. He didn't point them toward Zechariah or Jeremiah. He pointed them toward the prophet Daniel and to a place in Daniel chapter 11. And Jesus went even further to say about this place in Daniel 11, whoever reads, let him understand. It must be important. But Daniel chapter 11 is like beefsteak. And with beefsteak, you have to cut it up into pieces small enough to eat, and then you have to chew it a while. That's what we're going to need to do with this chapter. So we're going to start out by briefly looking over the chapter before this, Daniel chapter 10. In Daniel 10, we saw how that Daniel, a man by then well up into his 80s, had been praying and fasting for three weeks. But then, as he was with his friends beside the Tigris River, a mighty angel appeared to him, and the experience took him to the limits of what he was able to handle as a human being. The angel explained that he had been trying to get through to Daniel as his prayers had been heard. But the angel went on to say that a demon prince from the dark side of the spiritual world, the angel called him the Prince of Persia, had been withstanding the angel for the whole time. And it was revealed to Daniel that the archangel Michael, one of the chief princes, had come to help the angel and that he was now able to communicate with Daniel. Daniel chapter 10 contains some of the most profound revealing information in the Bible on the subject of the spiritual world and the warfare that goes on there. Chapter 10 laid the groundwork for the information that was then given to Daniel in chapter 11. We've already had a bird's eye view of chapter 10, but we'll look once more at the last couple of verses there and see how they flow into the beginning of Daniel chapter 11. Daniel 10 verses 20 and 21. Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. And no one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. And we'll go straight into Daniel 11. Also in the first year of Darius the Mede, I, even I, stood to confirm and strengthen him. And now I will tell you the truth. The text and dialogue flows right into chapter 11. The angel continues talking to Daniel. They just made a chapter break. In all the other chapters up to this, there was a clear end of the chapter at the last verse of the chapter. But here the text flows right into chapter 11. Daniel 11 verses 2b and 3. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. Then a mighty king shall arise, who shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. What I'll emphasize here is what is spoken about a mighty king shall arise. We know from history that this is speaking prophetically of Alexander the Great of Greece. We studied about him extensively in the video on Daniel chapter 8. Daniel 11 verse 4, And when he is arisen, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not among his posterity, nor according to his dominion which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be uprooted, even for others besides these. And here again we find an amazingly powerful prophetic prevision of the fate of Alexander the Great and his empire. It says, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided toward the four winds of heaven. Alexander's empire was indeed broken up into four parts. When Alexander was nearly 33 years old, he died of a high fever in a palace in Babylon. He had no son to succeed him, and so his empire was divided between his four top generals, just as Daniel was shown here. And this same division of the empire into four parts was also revealed in Daniel chapter 7, and again in Daniel chapter 8, Cassander ruled Macedonia and Greece, Lysimachus, the area we know today as Turkey, Seleucus, the region from Syria to India, and Ptolemy, the eastern Mediterranean, Egypt, and parts of North Africa. These four were called the Diadochi. It might surprise you to know that I've virtually never taught on what is the next section in Daniel 11, verses 5 to 20. The reason why I haven't taught about those verses in classes before this is because they're very detailed, and they're foretelling things that would happen from around the time of Alexander to the time of Jesus. 
Most of us in our times have never heard about those people or events, so I usually start up at verse 21. But since I'm doing a video on the chapter, I felt it would be good to include all the verses. You may find that you'll want to skip forward in the class by about four and a half minutes to where we start up with what are, for us, future events from verse 21. Or you may want to check out the history that the angel foretold to Daniel in verses 5 to 20. Daniel 11, verse 5. Also the king of the south shall become strong, as well as one of his princes, and he shall gain power over him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. Most of the verses in this section are going to be talking about the king of the south and the king of the north. This is in reference to what became the two main divisions of Alexander's empire. The southern part, which was the Ptolemaic realm, and then the northern part, which was the kingdom of Seleucus. These two kingdoms continually disputed over areas of what are modern-day Syria, Lebanon, and Israel. And so we get the phrase, the king of the north and the king of the south. Verses 6 through 8. And at the end of years they shall join themselves together. For the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the power of the arm. Neither shall he stand nor his arm, but she shall be given up and they that brought her, and he that begat her, and he that strengthened her in these times. But out of a branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army, and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north, and he shall deal against them, and shall prevail. He shall also carry captives into Egypt, their gods, with their princes, and with their precious vessels of silver and of gold, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north. Some wonderful research has been done a long ago to show how precisely and minutely these verses were fulfilled in the times after Alexander the Great. But I won't get into that here, since my focus will be on the prophetic verses still yet to be fulfilled. Verses 9 through 12. So the king of the south shall come into his kingdom and shall return into his own land. But his son shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces. And one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through. Then shall he return and be stirred up, even to his fortress. And the king of the south shall be moved with rage, and shall come forth and fight with him, even with the king of the north. And he shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand. And when he has taken away the multitude, his heart shall be lifted up, and he shall cast down many ten thousands, but he shall not be strengthened by it. In 217 BC, a war was fought in southern Palestine. Ptolemy IV, the king of the south, who had 70,000 infantrymen, 5,000 horsemen, and 73 elephants, fought against Antiochus III, the king of the north, who had slightly fewer but similar forces. Verses 13 through 16. For the king of the north shall return, and shall set forth a multitude greater than the former, and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army, and with much riches. In those times shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of your people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. So the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities, and the arms of the south shall not withstand, neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. But he that comes against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. History tells of Ptolemy the first, the second, the third, and the fourth, and of Antiochus, the first, the second, the third, and the fourth. We see Cleopatra, but not the Cleopatra of the Roman general Mark Anthony being spoken of in the next verses. Verses 17 to 20. He shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom, and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of women, corrupting her, but she shall not stand on his side, neither before him. After this shall he turn his face to the isles, and shall take many. But a prince for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach he shall cause it to turn upon him. Then he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble, fall, and not be found. Then shall stand up in his estate a razor of taxes and the glory of the kingdom. But within a few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. And we come up to verse 21. Why is that verse important? Some will notice that it looks like there's been a jump in the narrative, skipping over many centuries and then beginning again 
with the final events of the end time. We saw this same thing in Daniel chapter 9, and we're seeing it again here in chapter 11. Many wonder why God seems to look so minutely at certain portions of history and then skips over centuries in other places. I don't think anyone completely knows the answer to that. Possibly God focused on some of these pivotal landmark events still to come in order to tell us what's going to happen so that we'll know that He's in control and that He has a final and complete plan for bringing His kingdom to this earth. But Bible prophecy teachers from the early church to modern times have marked Daniel 11.21 as the beginning of the angel's description of the very final days before the Lord's return. This perplexes many people, and some have written me about how this is seen in an earlier class I did where this gap seems to appear in the class on the last seven years, focusing on Daniel 9.27 and Matthew 24. In Daniel 9, we saw this same gap between verse 26, which ends with a prediction of the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, and verse 27. The last part of Daniel 9.26 says, The people of the prince who shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. We know from history that this did happen when the armies of Titus destroyed Jerusalem and overran Israel in 70 AD. But then, what is strange for some, Going on to the very next verse in Daniel 9, verse 27, it says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. So here in Daniel 9, like we're also seeing at this place in Daniel 11, there seems to be a jump and a gap of centuries before the prophecy picks up again. Also, we saw in the classes on Daniel 9 that a week translated there came from the word that meant seven, signifying seven years. So Daniel 9.27, speaking of confirming the covenant for one week, is a verse about the last seven years, before the coming of the Lord, and it even goes on to talk about the middle of the week. The middle of seven years is three and a half years, and this ties in with so many other places in Daniel and in later books that talk about the last three and a half years. 42 months or 1260 days before the coming of the Lord. So let's look closely at how much this is relevant to just where we are in our study of Daniel chapter 11. In chapter 9, we had this evident gap in the narrative where centuries are skipped over, and then verse 27 begins by talking about a covenant made for one week or seven years. And here in Daniel 11, we find such a parallel phenomenon. From verse 21 to verse 30 in this chapter, we have no less than four different times that the word covenant or the similar word league is used in relation to this vile person. Then, immediately after verses 21 to 30, we come up to the verse that Jesus pointed us to in this chapter, verse 31. And in Matthew 24, Jesus said of verse 31, whoever reads, let him understand. I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself here, but this must be important. I can't prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt. But I've always felt that this portion of Scripture, from verse 21 to verse 30, is talking about what could be called the first three and a half years. In other words, the first half of the last seven years that was highlighted in Daniel 9. Because Daniel 11.31 is about as certain a place as we can find where Jesus places that event, seen in verse 31, at the beginning of the Great Tribulation. Pointing to that verse, Jesus said, When you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world unto this time, known or ever shall be. It just helps to kind of know where we are at before going forward with Daniel 11 verses 21 to 30. If we don't know the context, and where this portion of Scripture fits in the end time picture, we really won't get as much out of it as we should. Daniel 11.21 says, And in his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Going into the many details of each of these verses would greatly increase the length of this class. But what we want to do is to look at these as an outline or a template of events that will be taking place in the final days. We don't utterly know how it will all be fulfilled, 
but we do know that prophecy will be fulfilled and that what's spoken here will happen. What many teachers notice or point out with verse 21, besides this first reference to this vile person, is that it says, He shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Almost always, Satan's first attack on us is with words. It looks like in this case, at the beginning, the Antichrist will use subtlety and peaceable means to obtain his ends. Verse 22, With the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him, and shall be broken. Yea, also the prince of the covenant. Who is that prince of the covenant? Is that speaking of the Antichrist as the prince of the covenant? Or of some other figure who will be on the scene at the time, who has something to do with the covenant? We can't really be sure at this time. Verse 23, And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and become strong with a small people. Again, there's a reference to a league or a covenant. Something to point out, the word league or covenant in the Old Testament didn't always refer to the holy covenant of God. The same word is used in some places for a pact or an agreement between nations or individuals. Often through history there have been leagues, concords, agreements, and it's possible the covenant of the end time may have this aspect to it. Also we should note in verse 23, He shall come up and become strong with a small people. What's that about? There's plenty of speculation among Bible teachers about this. But that's what it is at this time, speculation. It's something to note what is mentioned about the Antichrist that will be fulfilled and will mark him for who he is when the time comes. Verse 24, He shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province. He shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey, spoil, and riches. Yea, he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. There's a lot to unpack in that verse. We are again given the word peace or peaceable with regard to the Antichrist in the first half of the last seven years. This man will have all the wisdom that Satan himself can give him. And more often, the devil works first as the serpent with lies rather than the dragon with violence. When I was younger, a lot was being made that the Antichrist and his empire would be based upon atheistic Marxist-Leninist communism. Old-style Marxism, as well as more recent neo-Marxism and cultural Marxism, often just use words and peaceable dialogue to win hearts and minds where they can. The middle part of verse 24 says, He shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey, spoil, and riches. Wealth redistribution is one of the foundations of Marxist socialist ideology, and that verse there could be taken to mean that. Since the collapse of communism, there have been fewer looking at things this way. But some feel that these and other things in Scripture point toward an atheistic Marxist-like ideology, as well as possibly Russia, being part of the end-time picture. Verse 25, He shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army. But he shall not stand, for they shall devise plans against him. Some people imagine that the Antichrist is going to be virtually omnipotent and unstoppable. But this chapter brings out that he has at least five wars during these last years. Someone or some ones are going to be opposing him, going to battle against him. Who's that going to be? We can't really say that we know for sure at this time, if we're honest. You know, I'm going to do something right here in the middle of the class. I'm going to put something here briefly before going forward with the next verses in Daniel chapter 11. Maybe 50% of you watching this right now are just doing fine with this. But maybe there's another 50% that are saying, what about the rapture? And then the first 50% are saying, what's the rapture? Because I know there are a lot of people watching who think something must be wrong. Here we are studying the first three and a half years of the last seven years before the return of Jesus, and Mark hasn't been talking about how suddenly all the believers are going to be taken away. I'm sure there are people watching this who've never heard of the rapture. 
that word is not found in the Bible. But I'll give you the verses that most fully speak about the event we call the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 says, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. But there's huge controversy about when the Lord comes for His saints, and it largely divides into two camps. One group, probably the larger one, had been taught that this event can happen at any moment. The other group believes that it won't happen until the end of the last seven years that the angel showed Daniel in chapter 9. Jesus did speak specifically about when He would come back. We've already seen in this class in Matthew chapter 24 where Jesus told us when the Great Tribulation would start. But a little later in the same chapter, He told us what would happen immediately after the Tribulation. Matthew 24, 29 to 31 says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And He will send His angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together His elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So clearly, Jesus said He would gather together His elect, not before, but immediately after the tribulation. And the Apostle Paul also spoke clearly and specifically about this. At the beginning of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul addressed what he was going to be talking about. Now we beseech you, my brothers, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and are gathering together unto Him." And then Paul went on to clarify what the conditions would be at the time of the Lord's coming and are gathering together unto Him. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The first thing you may notice is that here in the New Testament, hundreds of years after Daniel, the picture and teaching is exactly the same as we've been seeing in Daniel. Paul couldn't have been clearer when he said, That day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed. The day of Jesus' return to this earth will not happen before the man of sin, the Antichrist, is revealed. And Paul went on to describe exactly the same thing that we've been seeing in the prophecies of Daniel about the Antichrist, that he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. But some of you may wonder, what about what I've been taught? What about the verses I've been shown? It's difficult for me to say this, and I don't mean to disappoint anyone, but I've seen those verses too, and for me, they just don't really carry the same weight or have the same clarity as the verses do which speak clearly and plainly about the Lord's coming at the end of the tribulation, at the end of the last seven years. Those who believe in a rapture at any moment feel they have scriptures that imply an earlier gathering of the saints. It is said that it can be seen in Scripture. It's understood in Scripture. It's taken for granted in Scripture. But when you really look at the verses put forward, they never directly declare an earlier gathering of the saints. They never teach plainly that there will be a rapture before the tribulation. If Jesus knew He was going to come back more than once in the end time, why didn't He tell us clearly about it? If Paul saw more than one coming of the Lord, why didn't he tell us about it right here in 2 Thessalonians 2 when he was talking about it? Some of you may be disappointed. Some of you may even be mad. But I just felt that I should address this subject right here as so many have been taught that we could all be taken away 
just any minute now. But this is a class on Daniel chapter 11, so let's get back to that. Daniel 11, verses 26 through 28. Yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. Both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. Then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. The thing I noticed the most in these verses is another mention of the covenant, and in this case it's called the holy covenant. His heart shall be against the holy covenant. Verses 29 and 30, At the time appointed he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. For the ships of Chittim shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return, and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. Three times in three verses there's mention of the covenant or the holy covenant. The Antichrist shall have indignation against the Holy Covenant. He shall have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. And this is all just before that most significant verse, verse 31. Maybe you've heard before about how the Antichrist breaks the covenant. This is where that's seen and noted. At the end of the last class, I said that we were going to be coming up to a mountain hut far up in the mountains of Bible prophecy. That's where we are now, verse 31. Jesus pointed to that verse and said we should understand it. It's a place we have as a reference point of where we are in the end time picture. But arriving here, you may not now feel like it's a place of serenity. You may be sensing from the verses we just read that Daniel 11:31 is actually a place of ominous significance because this verse that Jesus said we should understand and take note of actually marks the beginning of Great Tribulation. The last three and a half years before the end of this age and the return of the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, to set up the Kingdom of God on earth. Daniel 11.31 says, And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that makes desolate. And here's what Jesus said about that verse in Matthew chapter 24. When you shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. What we see at this point is how definitely these major verses link together to form a composite picture of the key events of the end time. Jesus did that in Matthew 24 when He linked Daniel 11.31 with the Great Tribulation that would start then. And Daniel 9.27 also links conclusively with the things we're seeing in Daniel 11. It can be difficult at first to put these things together, but when we look at them, it is clear that the links are there in Scripture for us to see. Let's look at Daniel 9.27 again and see how we can now see the connections it has with other major verses. And he shall confirm the covenant. We've seen that word or idea used repeatedly in the verses we've seen here in Daniel 11, with many for one week, seven years, and in the middle of the week. In other words, at the three and a half year mark, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Sacrifices stopped in the soon to be built temple in Jerusalem. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. A reference to the abomination of desolation that Jesus said in Matthew 24 would be a sign to watch for, even until the consummation, the end, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. And we have so much the same picture here in Daniel 11.31. And shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that makes desolate. By connecting these verses the way they certainly connect, not forcing things, not contriving things, we come to an astonishingly clear picture of one of the most spoken of events of the final days, 
the stopping of sacrifices in a yet to be built temple in Jerusalem by the Antichrist and the placing of what is called the abomination of desolation. Jesus told us with emphasis that when we see these things, then will be great tribulation. Earlier in the class, we already looked forward to the happy ending of it all, because at the end of this period of time will be the happy ending, the coming of the Lord, when the true rapture happens, when Jesus comes for believers throughout the earth and brings in His rule and reign for a thousand years. And I wanted to add just a little more to show another aspect of all this. There's another place in the Bible that talks about this time of trouble that's known and studied by a lot of people. Jeremiah 30 verse 7 says, Alas, for the day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. The time of Jacob's trouble is taken to be speaking of the same thing as the time of great tribulation that Jesus spoke of in Matthew 24. But the focus here is on what the people of Israel, the descendants of the ancient patriarch Jacob, will be going through in those future last days. You've probably noticed that so much of what's been spoken of in the verses we've been looking at in Daniel 11 is taking place in and around Jerusalem. The sanctuary of strength, the daily sacrifice. What sanctuary? What sacrifice? These verses and many others strongly indicate that these places and events will be in modern Jerusalem. And of course, this is against the backdrop of modern Israel. So these end time events are going to have a very major impact on Jewish people and on the modern nation of Israel. The horrible persecution of the times to come will not only be against Christians around the world, but also against Jews in Israel and anyone who doesn't go along with the will of the Antichrist. I haven't dwelt on this so much in my classes, but it certainly needs to be made clear that this will happen. And I'm finding that there has to be a balance in these things. It's certainly true that much of what we read about in Daniel chapter 11 is taking place in Israel in the last seven years. But in no way does that mean that the rest of the people of the world are just going to be spectators to these events. Revelation 13, 8, speaking of the Antichrist, says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not found written in the book of life. At the return of Jesus, Revelation 16 says, And the cities of the nations fell. Not just the cities in Israel and the Middle East, but of the nations of this world. These and many other verses all point towards this very definitely being a worldwide series of events leading up to the return of Jesus to rule the whole world. In the next class, we'll start up at verse 31 and go to the end of Daniel 11. In the class today, we focused on the first three and a half years, but in the next class, we'll be looking at the last three and a half years. And there's a lot of good news even there. We'll see in the next class that the people who do know their God shall be strong and do exploits, and they that understand among the people shall instruct many. There's so much more to look into, to take to heart, and to see how it applies to our lives already right now and in the soon coming future. In the next class on Daniel 11, we're going to see the living saints of the end time in the Great Tribulation mentioned and highlighted there. I hope you'll be back to check it out for yourself. I intend to get it out as soon as I can. God bless you. I love you. Keep the faith.